I'm going to talk about estate agents, um, I'm going to talk about the Sex Pistols, and I'm going to explain why you are what you buy. Um, so here's my bit of introduction. So marketing has two main levers, okay? The one of the levers that it uses um, is sales activation, which drives short-term demand. So that gives you cash flow, cash inflow. Um, the other main lever that it has is long-term brand building. But actually, those are the two main levers. They're not the only things that marketing does. There are what we call the manifold effects of marketing. Marketing does a lot of things. Um, it achieves a lot of things for an organization. It creates value in different ways. So it can reduce the price sensitivity of your customers. If you have a strong brand, um, then they become less price sensitive. Um, it will reduce the base erosion of your sales. If you stop doing marketing activity, your sales will decline over time. Uh, marketing stops that erosion. Uh, it gives you economies of scale. It allows you to launch new products, do brand extensions. It can even reduce the risk of competitor entry. A great example of this is spec savers. They absolutely dominate the high street for opticians. Who else? You know, name me another high street optician. They, there's just reduced risk of entry because their brand is so strong. So the challenge within marketing is the difference between short-termism uh, and effectiveness. So within the short term, there are certain things that work, certain things that you do. Those are not the same as marketing effectiveness. You need to do things differently. And I'll talk about those in a bit. But I just want to cover some myths, because there are certain myths um, around how, how things work and how value is created. The first myth I want to talk about is the myth of linearity, which is that if you take any two um, uh, constants or any two ideas, that they are related in a linear way, so more is better. So uh, as an example, you might say that if you negotiate a slightly lower price, a bigger cost saving is even better. If you use data to make a decision, more data will help you make a better decision. That is a myth, actually, that there is a, not everything is a straight line, not every relationship is a straight line, there's a curve, there's, there's too little, too much, and there's a balance in the middle. Um, the, so some costs, some price reductions are not worth having if you pay too little for something and actually you don't get the quality. Um, more data can sometimes just be more confusing. Uh, shareholder value concept is another myth. Shareholder value, essentially, in, it, in, in the way that it's understood, says if I can measure something financially in a 90-day world, then that's good. Anything else that I can't measure in that doesn't exist. Okay? Uh, the other bit, and that leads me into sort of financial savings versus economic losses. A financial saving is, is easy to measure. You know, if I'm paying my ad agency X and I negotiate a price reduction down to Y, that's a nice, easy financial saving to measure. If that causes my organisation to suffer economic losses, that's sort of invisible. If I start with a P&L and I don't do all the, I, I lose those manifold benefits of marketing, then, then that's an economic loss that I can't measure. Uh, and so there's a myth that those don't exist. And then this is what I call the professional buying myth, which is actually three interrelated myths. Uh, and this is based on my experience of having been an FD of agencies and seen the way that my services or my agency's services are bought. So the first one is that value is fixed. It, it just stays the same. It's not affected uh, by the buyer's, buyer's behavior during the buying process. And the final one is minimizing seller's profit as a valid proxy for increasing value. So I'm going to untangle those uh, a little bit with, a, with a, a diagram. So here we have cost, price, and value. So price is, as a buyer, what you pay, as a seller, what you sell it at. Cost is my cost to produce. Value is the value that's created as a result of the thing that's done. So as an agency FD, what is my experience? That Buyers, professional buyers will come in and they start by attacking my cost base and say, you don't need that cost base, you need a lower cost base. Then they'll start by attacking the price and the, and the difference, my seller's profit, and say, actually, you, know, you don't need a 20% margin, you know, we're on a 3% margin, you can have a 3% margin. So essentially, reducing cost, reducing price, and if value remains fixed, then the buyer's profit increases. And in any transaction, there needs to be a buyer's profit as well as a seller's profit. Yeah? If price is greater than value, then, then that wasn't a wasn't a good transaction. Now, the problem with that is that actually the way you behave in the buying process can destroy value. If you don't get access to the best talent, to discretionary effort, you will destroy value. So this is not a proxy for that. Does that make sense? 
So let's talk about a little bit about reality. How, how does the world look from my perspective? So this is what, how we see effectiveness uh, at the IPA, and this is based on our IPA research. So I'm, I'm literally just going to read these through, but I'll take you through them in, in a bit more detail. So the first thing is that a series of short-term effects does not necessarily lead to a successful long-term effects. Long-term effects are more than just an accumulation of short-term effects. I'll explain this in more detail. Next one, volume growth is quickly achieved via activation. Reducing price sensitivity via branding takes longer. Optimum profit growth requires both of these. And the final one is that long-term effects are generated differently from short-term effects. So essentially what this is saying is the things that do good in the short term, the things that you can measure financially, don't give you the long-term value. And that's the tension between short-termism and effectiveness. So here's, a, here's an example of the short term. This is an econo economist's graph. But essentially what you've got here, if you see two names in the corner, Lesbinette, Peter Field, both work in the advertising sector, uh, done lots of research on IPA case studies. If you do sales activation, so promotions, money off, bog off, you get a, a rapid sales uplift, but it decays very quickly. So you've got the volume, but it decays. If you take a longer term approach, the blue line here, this is brand building. Okay? Once you've built your brand, brand build, more brand building activity doesn't give you the instant sales uplift that sales activation will give you. But what happens is the effects of the brand building will erode more slowly over time. So you know, to use a sort of food analogy, the, the sales activation is a bit like a sugar rush. You get a sudden hit, and then it goes. Brand building is more like eating protein. It keeps you fuller for longer, but you don't get that sudden rush. You know, if you're, if you're competing in sport and you need energy, you, you, you'd, need, you'd need something different. So what happens if you have a series of only short-term activities? It's going to look like this sawtooth pattern. If you're constantly doing sales activation, it's like a series of sugar rushes. You're constantly pushing up your volume, but then it's falling back. The other challenge is that sales activation actually increases price sensitivity amongst your customer base. So if you're only focused on short-term activities that you can measure in a 90-day cycle, then you're increasing the price sensitivity of your customers. You can't increase prices, which is where you're getting more value. So you need to do sales activation to generate cash flow to keep your business solvent, but actually that's not delivering value. That's not delivering growth. So you do a bit of both. You need brand building work that increases the value of your brand over time, but that's an investment. And the sort of time scale for brand building is one to three years. So you need cash flow in the short term coming in, keeping you solvent, helping you meet your quarterly targets. And within that, but it's, it's also making your brand building harder because it's going to increase, uh, if you do too much of it, it's going to increase price sensitivity. Your brand building is trying to reduce price sensitivity. It's allowing you to put prices up over time. So get the right mix of those, and you get profitable growth. Right. Where am I going to go next? So Les Binet, Peter Field had done this research. This is a, a, an IPA publication called The Long and Short of It, looking at long-term strategies, short-term strategies. And they published that in 2013. So what we did this year was we asked them, to, can you come and update it, and can you just have a look at what's happened since then? Uh, and what they found is that short-termism is rising. So when we look at the case studies that people are sending, it's more about short-term activities and measures, uh, business effects that are measurable in the short term. So the question is, what effect is this having on the creation of value within our industry? Well, the red line is effectiveness. It hits a peak in about 2006, and the overall trend is down. They put a question mark on it politely, but... Can you see there's a correlation there? More short-termism within the industry, less effectiveness. There is a balance of the two that is needed. So what's going wrong here? I think the problem is the challenge of buying investments as investments. So thinking about how we buy, what we buy, uh, and how it needs to be done. So um, I think the key challenge for the buying function is to maximise the value created for the organisation. So I'm going to take you through an example that hopefully is close to home. 
which is um, imagine that I'm selling my house and I need two estate agents. So this guy comes round. I don't think I'm going to use him. So here's a young lady who's much more presentable. Her suit fits. She looks like the sort of person who could sell my house. So I'm reasonably happy with her. And then this very presentable, very self-confident, quiffed young man comes around and he, he looks like he could do the job as well. So I now have a short list. I have two people who can possibly sell my house. One of them is offering to do it at 1.5% commission. One is saying it's 2.5% commission. So the question is, which one do I choose? The answer is the person who can sell my house for the most money. That's what I'm looking for. That's the business outcome that I need, is to sell my house for as much money as possible. And the point is, I need to behave with them in a way that is going to incentivise the discretionary effort that gets me the highest possible price. I need to be the sort of customer that they want to work with. What I pay them, whether it's 1.5%, whether it's 2.5%, doesn't really matter. All I need to know is that if I pay them too little, then they're, gonna, they're just not interested. If I pay them too much, I'm wasting my money. There is a balance in the middle, somewhere between 1.5% and 2.5%, and maybe even a little bit more, maybe between 1% and 3 but there is a range that, that's fine. Now, what if I were to say, I don't like that deal because I want to know what you're doing to sell my house? So instead of paying you on commission, I'm going to pay you on an activity basis. So every time you make a phone call, yeah, to sell my, I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll pay for that phone call for your time. Every time you put up a board, I'll do that for every house showing. Let's break it down into a series of activities that will get you from me wanting to sell my house to my house being sold. What is that going to do to our relationship? What it's going to do is it means that every potentially value-adding activity that they do I now see as an additional cost. I'm now focusing on the cost of doing business with these guys rather than where our aligned interests are, which is maximising the sale of my sale price of my house. It also means that if they pick up the phone, do I know whether they're doing it because it's really going to add value to my house or because they want to make more money out of me? That trust has broken down now because every activity they do, I don't know whether it's for my interests or their interests. Whereas if we have an outcomes-based relationship, which is you just take a percentage of what you sell my house for, I know that you're incentivised to maximise the value of my house that you get for me. So let's think about personal styles. Um, back to buying advertising and other investments. Challenges. Have, do, you, do you know the, the sales types? There are relationship builders, problem solvers, hard workers, lone wolves and challengers. Challengers are the sorts of people who are the most successful in a complex selling environment. So those are the people you want working on your, on your complicated brand problems. What do they look like when you, when you work with a challenger? They're going to push back on the brief that you give to them. They're going to question the assumptions that you've made in there. Um, and they're going to talk about well, what is the business outcome we're trying to achieve here. So I say these are the most successful people. And it's precisely because they don't do what you tell them to do. If I tell you to do something and you say, well, what is it you're trying to achieve? If you interrogate what I'm trying to get to, that's the challenger. You're working hard to get to a, a better business outcome. So they have a different view. They understand the customer's business. They like to debate. That is the very definition of being creative. So challengers are the creative people who are going to drive value. What you don't want working on your big brand problem is a hard-working, problem-solving relationship builder. They're going to be having this meeting. Yeah? They're not going to drive the value. They're going to be building relationships. <coughs> so the question is, how are you buying? Are your buying processes designed to buy investments as investments? And are they going to get you access to the challenges? Your buying process impacts your ability to gain access not just to the best suppliers, but the best talent within the best suppliers. If your buying process signals that you're going to be an undesirable client, the best ad agencies are just not going to turn up. And the ones that do are not going to put their best people on your account. 
because they'll fear they'll lose them because they're not going to enjoy working with you or because they can simply make more money elsewhere on bigger and better clients. So your challenge is to select the agency, not just to select the agency from a long list, it's to establish that if there are there agencies out there who are not even pitching for your business because of the way you've signalled your buying process. And then you have to behave in a way that incentivizes maximum discretionary effort to get the best talent on your business. And if you go and see this chap who's talking this afternoon, he's done much more work on this than me. I've stolen all his best ideas. So how are you buying? And what are you buying? And what does that mean you're getting? I think we've covered this already a little bit. Are you buying inputs? These sorts of things. Hours, timesheets, staff costs. If you are, you're buying commodities. So these don't distinguish between busy fools and eureka moments. As we saw in my estate agent example, they're going to increase the conflict between buyers and sellers. They're going to reduce the level of trust and collaboration because I'm going to start, I'm, inevitably, I'm going to micromanage your time you spend on my account if that's driving costs. I'm going to say, no, don't spend four hours on that, spend three hours on that. I think you're padding. We've already stopped talking about the business outcome that we're trying to achieve. Now we're arguing about how many hours you're putting down on my account. So what about buying outputs? What if I buy TV spots, if I buy campaigns, media plans? Well, that's stuff. It might be stuff that does stuff, but it's still stuff. It's still buying things. Where you want to be as buyers is in the outcomes business. What is it that's going to drive value for your organisation? How can I buy things that are going to reduce my base erosion, make sure that my sales stay level, things that allow me to put up my price, things that will let, allow me to do market entry? The other point here, have you seen the, uh, the Harvard study, the 1% windfall? If you can add 1%, take 1% off costs, add 1% to sales volume, add 1% to pricing, which of those is going to drive the biggest value increase in your business? It's the 1% in pricing. That's the thing you want to do. If you can only do one, pull one lever, move one item by 1%, price increasing is what you want to do. So therefore, when you're buying advertising, your advertising is looking to increase your price. That's what it needs to be doing. But that is a process that is best measured over one to three years. It doesn't fit neatly into a 90-day world. And also, you don't have that benefit of a parallel universe in which you didn't do that activity to say, OK, what is, what is the value I've lost by not being able to increase my prices? So I want to leave you with one final thought. Would the Sex Pistols have gone on a reality talent show? Does anybody know? Hands up if you know who the guy on the left is. Steve someone. Steve someone. So I had to Google this. His name is Steve Brookstein. He was the first winner of the X Factor. He was voted for by the public, and he disappeared without a trace. No, he played once the cricket club this summer. Oh, right. <laughs> there you go. See what he's doing now. <laughs> Did you all know who the guys on the right are? Yeah? So my question is, of these two, who do you think has a stronger brand? By which I mean not whose music do you like better, or do you think that God Save the Queen is one of the great musical statements in the canon of British music, but which one is recognisable, which one is distinctive, which one, 40 years later, is still iconic? Even if you don't know the Sex Pistols, you've got to know they're punks. They, they created a movement. So here's the question. Which one of those do you think would have gladly followed a rigid buying process? That's me done.